early history of Vermont, water power was very important to the settlers. There was no electricity, no gas, internal combustion engines, not even any steam engines. So water power was an important thing for the settlers. And so you'll notice a lot of communities in Vermont grew up around the water power, and that was certainly true here in Jericho. Jericho is actually blessed with three streams that provided water power. The uh, Mill Brook in the southern part of the town had three mills. Lee River in the center part of the town had two mill sites. But the best water power was on the Browns River in the northern part of Vermont, or northern part of Jericho. And within a stretch of just over a mile, the river drops 132 feet. And so this provided seven different, what they're called mill privileges, sites that were appropriate to build a mill on. Um, we're going to tell you a brief history of all of these mill sites, but most importantly, we're going to talk about the uh, mill privilege number two on the Browns River, where the Chittenden Mills roller mill is located. There were three mills on Millbrook and two on Lee River. These supported sawmills, shingle mills, a grist mill, a starch factory, a clothier's shop, a rake factory, a woolen mill, and a woodenware factory. This photo shows the woodenware factory on Mill Brook in the Muttonville section of town, which was operated by Truman and Augustus Wood. While owned by E.W. Curtis, this sawmill was washed away in a flood in 1903. Note the covered bridge in the right of the photo and parts of Chittenden Mills in the background. On the east side of the river at this site were three buildings. The upper building was for manufacturing woolen cloth, built by Matthew Barney before 1804, and was powered by the dam above the bridge. This was later used as a tin shop by Joseph Bissonette. The middle building was for carding wool, built by Truman Barney before 1820, and the lower building was also built by Truman Barney and was used for cloth dressing. By the 1850s, the middle building was used for carding and as a cider mill, finally being taken down about 1900. The lower building was used as a sash and blind factory by Henry and George Shedd and was taken down about 1900 as well. In 1877, Henry Field and Simon Bullock began their business of manufacturing chairs and for six years did a flourishing business, selling chairs as far away as South America. Mill Privilege No. 5 on Pump Road was the site of a factory used to make wooden water pumps and wooden water pipes. It was originally built by Simon Davis about 1840 and was the only business of its kind in Vermont. Mill Privilege No. 6, also on Pump Road, had a sawmill built there before 1840. Besides general lumber production, the mill at times provided the material for the pump factory. Mill Privilege No. 7, on Silly Hill Road had a sawmill on the south side of the river prior to 1819. In 1910, Mr. Williams built a sawmill on the north side of the river. That mill burned in 1928 and the present building was built to replace it. The mill ceased operation about 1961 and the building was converted into a home. By at least 1815, a man named John Bliss had built a grist mill on the site. By about 1820, it was being operated by Truman Barney. Um, by the early 1840s, it had been converted to a starch mill by Matthew Barney. The starch mill was where they would take potatoes and make them into starch. In the early 1850s, it was used as a cabinet maker's shop by Anson Field and did an extensive furniture business. Then in 1857, James Harvey Hutchinson, who had, was from Jericho, but had gone to California during the California gold rush, had made his money there, not by finding gold, but by selling cattle and mules to the prospectors. And he returned to Jericho and in 1857, built a new grist mill here. Parts of the mill that you see here today, the stonework pretty much, is from that 1857 mill. It had four runs of stones and was powered by turbines, not a water wheel. It employed five men, 
In the late 1860s, the mill was purchased by Ferdinand Beach and Lucian Howe, and in 1871, Mr. Howe became the sole owner. Lucian Howe was one of the local businessmen who promoted the building of the Burlington and Lamoille Railroad through Jericho, and once it began operation in 1877, he shipped large quantities of grain in from the Midwest to grind in his mill, along with locally grown grain. In the early 1880s, he went into partnership with his son Frank, and in early 1885, they decided to expand their business even further, traveling to Columbus, Ohio to contract with the Case Manufacturing Company to provide millwright work for the mill. The mill shut down in June of 1885, and the front wall was taken down, with the building being expanded closer to the road. The house hired Mr. A.C. Chick of Melrose Highlands, Massachusetts to do blasting to increase the head of water and thus the power available to run the new mill. Mr. Chick started blasting at the water level of Curtis's mill pond. He used dynamite, a new and novel thing at the time, when many townspeople turned out to see the work. He blasted a channel eight feet wide and continued upstream to the wheelhouse, going progressively lower in the height of the ledge as the height of the ledge increased. By mid-June, the wheelhouse was being gutted in preparation for the blasting. He not only lowered the tail race, but blasted inside the walls of the wheelhouse, taking the ledge down six and a half feet at the front and eight feet at the rear of the wheelhouse, and despite the predictions of local residents, did so without damaging the walls of the wheelhouse. This increased the head of water to 27 feet and powered four Tyler turbines, which along with 20 tons of shafting and gears were furnished by Edward Stevens and Company of Winooski. Mr. Chick also blasted ledge in the mill basement to both prepare the foundation of the mill extension and to give room for machinery. Meanwhile, by mid-June, the Sinclair brothers were busy starting the work on the expanding the mill. The upper floors were entirely new, with the walls being two by six plank laid flat one upon another. By mid-August, the elevator tower was nearing completion and the exterior above the stone walls was being covered with the Montrose metal shingles that Mr. Howe had purchased from E. Van Norden and Company in Boston. In September, the storehouse had been moved and attached to the rear of the main mill building. As the building structure was completed, the new machinery was being installed. This picture of the mill was probably taken in 1886. A platform scale just visible in the right of this picture was in the front yard, used to weigh wagons with grain coming into the mill. You can also see in the left background some of the buildings that were along the back of the mill yard. Also notice that the rear portion of the mill building is flush with the front part. The cost of the renovations is unknown except for the blasting and foundation work which cost the house about $7,000. That would be just over $200,000 in today's money. Well, this leads to speculation that the entire renovation in today's funds must have cost at least three quarters of a million dollars, if not even more. Business continued to boom. One newspaper article in November 1886 stated, the Chittenden Roller Mills ran night and day last week from Monday noon until Saturday night at 12 o'clock turning out patent flour. They make an average of 50 barrels a day. Flour production continued until the death of Mr. Clerkin in 1904 when it ceased and the rolls were sold. From then on, the mill produced only animal feed and oxidant flour from the Russell Miller Milling Company in Minnesota. The first all-purpose flour was shipped in for resale. This mill finally ceased operation in 1946. This small doorway in the side of the mill here in this built into the stonework at first glance doesn't really look like much but it actually was a key part of the whole mill operation because this is where when grain was brought to the mill it was all dumped through this small doorway into the bottom of the main elevator then taken up in the in that elevator to the top of the elevator tower and distributed through different parts of the mill to whatever function it needed to go to the mill house, built in 1859, was the home for each successive owner and operator of the mill through the years. It is in the Gothic Revival style. Even though the mill had a lot of customers, a lot of traffic going by all the time, the house was really just a private residence. And so they had this little sign engraved in the ledge to let folks know that. 
Due to the natural ledge on the east bank of the river, the mill dam was only about 20 feet long, although a low spot in the ledge required a small accessory dam where water overflowed in times of high water. This shows the forebay where the water from the mill pond entered the wheelhouse in the 1940s. After almost 100 years, the shingle on the mill roof had deteriorated, and in 1978, the society was able to have dyes made to reproduce the distinctive pattern shingles. But it took still more time to raise the funds to install them on the very high and steep roof. This photo shows work underway on the elevator tower in November 1993. Here we see the mill in November 1994 after the roof had been entirely replaced and both that and the metal part of the side walls painted. The society decided not to repaint the stone walls of the mill red as they had originally been done, but this still brought the building back to much of what it would have looked like back in 1886. We're now in the middle level of the wheelhouse. The wheelhouse actually has three levels but the lowest level is no longer accessible due to the river channel blockage and water being backed up in here. This photo shows the lowest level in the wheelhouse in 1983. In this view you can see where the timber framing fits into notches cut in the ledge. This picture looks from the front toward the back showing the middle level in 1983 after the framing had been rebuilt. These 1981 photos show this level while the Seabees were rebuilding the wheelhouse roof, installing new rafters to replace ones which had been broken. This is an example of how the shafting would have been in the basement. You notice these big heavy timbers were what were supporting it, and you'd had pulleys various sizes and shapes, and the belts from the wheelhouse would have come in through these openings in the wall we've been talking about onto the pulleys in here, and then belts would have run from that shafting on other pulleys up to like this one that goes up to another shaft up by the ceiling here. Or in this case in particular, there would have been belts going up right directly above onto the first floor to power the roller mills. Now we're on the first floor of the mill. This door here on the front would have been the main entrance for most customers coming to the mill. And this was also the area where the grinding took place. So this, this area has been where all of the activity would have happened. These are four case roller mills, very similar to what was in this mill originally. The original ones were made by the Case Manufacturing Company in Columbus, Ohio, and that company wasn't in business for very long, so a lot of the machinery that was in this mill is really pretty scarce. So this is a close-up of one of the roller mills. You can open this door and see the actual rolls in here. This mechanism up here, as the grain is coming down the chute, this actually vibrates back and forth, and that would shake the grain out so it would fall evenly onto the rollers, not just all in one spot. And the rollers are turning against each other to grind the grain, but one of them is turning faster than the other. So there's a shearing action. These rolls here, as we'll see in a moment, are corrugated and so that would help to grind the grain, break the wheat berry up into smaller pieces. And then it goes through some sifting equipment and then comes back down. And so as we go down the line, the corrugations first get finer and then the rolls actually are, the last of them are actually smooth. And so that makes the, gives the ability to grind the particles of grain into flour finer and finer. This is the flour packer that was part of the equipment that we purchased in Pennsylvania at the Pleasant Valley Roller Mills, but it is fortunate, it is absolutely identical to the original flour packer that was in this mill, made by the Richmond City Mill Works in Richmond, Indiana. This is a photo of Frank Hell beside the Richmond City Mill Works flour packer, which is in the same location it is today. The part, platform down at the bottom where the barrel is sitting on actually would have been started out being raised up part way and as the flour filled the barrel, it would, the barrel would get heavier and it would keep moving down and moving down and moving down until it got to the point where it was full, in which case it tripped a, a mechanism that stopped it from filling any further. This is the Richmond Brand Duster, again a machine that came from Pennsylvania, 
but again, is absolutely identical to the original one that was in this mill that we'll see remnants of up on the third floor. This was, would have originally been on the third floor of the mill, but it's just down here for display for the historic purposes. We're now on the second floor of the main mill building. The front part of this area was originally divided up into bins to store grain. Altogether, these bins would have hold something in the neighborhood of 187 tons of wheat. The walls in this level and above in the mill are actually two by six plank laid flat one top of the other. So it's a six inch solid wood wall. And that along with these beams you see all around bolted to the walls gave it the strength to hold up that amount of weight. The rear section of this area would have been for processing equipment. We're now on the third floor of the mill. This was mainly just an area where there was a lot of chutes running around to distribute the grain to the various machines and bins and so forth on the lower floors. But there was some processing equipment up here as well. The main one was this thing called a case centrifugal reel. Once the grain had been carried up to the top of the main elevator, by the, by the main elevator to the top of the elevator tower, it was fell then by gravity down to the various storage bins or machinery or whatever, and it had to be able to be diverted from one place to another. This is an example of how that would have happened. You have this chute coming down, which carries on down to a bin over further to the left, but then it could be also diverted down this chute to a bin further to the right. So when grain needed to be diverted from one bin to another, that was done by opening a door in the chute. The grain would have been going down here. Now you can lift up this door here and now the grain will be diverted down the other chute. This is just an example of some of the multitude of chutes that ran around the various parts of this floor to get the grain from one area to another. We've spoken about the shaft bringing power up from the basement to the upper floors. This is where it came up through the floor onto this level. And these four timbers, and when I say four timbers, you're going to say, gee, I only see three. That's because one was taken out to uh, be able to remove the shafting back when it was sold for scrap iron. But these four timbers are what supported the top of that shaft. And the two heavy timbers running horizontally are what supported a horizontal shaft that this shaft connected into and that, that shaft running along that powered the equipment on this floor. Over the years, of course, a lot of people visited the mill because it was such an attractive building and a lot of them toured the upper levels of well. And a few of them even took time to sign their names. And this is one of the more interesting ones. It reads, Olive Larkin, Jess Walker, August 21st, 1909 seeing the sights in Jericho. This shaft powered the equipment in the small cupola on the back part of the mill. That was how power got transferred into that part of the building. We're now in the first level of the elevator tower and this was um, an area below my feet here where the power shaft was running. Connected to that power shaft was a belt running up through to the main top of the main elevator, which we'll see in a few minutes. And so this little partition here was so that for somebody that was happened to be going up this next set of stairs, they wouldn't get tangled up in the belt. This is another reel. We're not quite sure just what the use of it was, but fortunately for the historic purposes, it remained relatively intact when most everything else in the mill was scrapped. We're now in the small cupola next to the chimney where the chute from the main elevator came down to the forward part of the building. We're now on the second or main level of the elevator tower. Um, fortunately, this is one that has a pretty complete floor even. Um, you see the stairs here that will uh, go on up to the second or the third level, the upper level we'll talk about. And otherwise, here we are. What we're looking at here is the remnants of the main elevator for the mill. This side over here, you can see the buckets that would have been coming up all the way from the bin in the basement, all the way up through the building, over the top of the pulley we'll see in a moment up above, 
then coming back down on this side, all of this would have been enclosed in a wooden box like this, all the way down through to the basement. Looking at this view on a nice sunny day, you can see why people wanted to come up to the cupola to get the view. Now we're looking at the very top of the main elevator in the third level of the elevator tower. Here you see the framing for the inside of the cupola roof, and up at the very top of the roof is the little small cupola where the finial is located on. We're now on the second floor of the rear part of the mill, and most of what is stored in this area is some of the equipment that we got from the mill in Pennsylvania that is not otherwise on display here in the mill. These are the stairs that go up to the third and fourth levels of the rear part of the mill. We're now on the third level of the rear part of the mill. This area today is basically just used for storage in a, for a couple of different things. One, it's once the uh, machinery was stripped out of the mill and the iron was sold off for scrap metal, all of the wooden parts were just stashed up here. So there's remnants of several of the machines, but certainly no complete machine or anything. Also, we spoke about the machinery that the Historical Society acquired from the Pleasant Valley Roller Mills down in Pennsylvania. Parts of, from that machinery are stored up here as well. This building is constructed a little heavier than a normal building of the period would have been because of all the weight that would have been in it from the stored grain. And so this iron rod that you see going across the building to anchor the two sides together to keep it from spreading out was just one additional piece to help support the building. We're now in the cupola on the rear portion of the mill. And what we're looking at up in the very top of that cupola is a windlass. Down below our feet, there were trap doors in each level all the way to the ground level. And if you opened all of those with this windlass, you'd be able to hoist a bag of grain up to any level along up through the building. We hope you've enjoyed the story of Jericho's industrial past and the tour of the Chittenden Mills flour mill, Jericho's most notable mill building now today being preserved by the Jericho Historical Society for future generations.